are some housekeeping items to cover. Um, everyone is currently on mute. If you have questions, please type them into the chat field as they come to your mind and the chat feature is at the bottom of your screen. We will have a lot of time at the end of this roughly 40 minute session for Q&A and we'll do our best to get to as many of your questions as possible. But please understand that we can't current, anybody who's currently booked on a TAUC tour, we can't answer specific questions about your TAUC uh, tour operations in this event. So please call our reservation sales counselors and they would be happy to discuss those specifics. Now, let's turn some cameras on. We have a couple of guests here. Hi guys. So keep in mind that our guests here are joining us live from Banff, Alberta today. So you may experience some technical hiccups or delays, but please know that this presentation will be recorded and available tomorrow afternoon at our travel blog, the Talker at talk.com slash blog. So let's start originally from Vancouver, British Columbia. Sarah Brooking moved to Banff for a winter ski season and two decades later, she's still there. Um, she has been leaving, leading TAUC guests through the Canadian Rockies for over 20 years. And in her early career with TAUC, she led tours to Peru, Galapagos Islands, and Costa Rica. Now, as a mother of two daughters, she, she stays much closer to home. And we are so lucky because she was able to capture for us today's video highlights and history of her hometown, Banff, Alberta. Um, also joining us today from Banff is Lucas Prochaska. Lucas is the Senior Manager of Business Development at Banff and Lake Louise Tourism. He was born and raised in Czech Republic. Lucas found his way to the US working in various hospitality positions through Yellowstone and Grand Canyon National Parks. And like Sarah, his passion for the mountains and the outdoors led Lucas right to sunny Alberta, which is where he calls his home. Now, everybody, let's go ahead and turn off our videos and take off our mics and bring all of you to BAMP for a little bit. Welcome everybody to my backyard. My name is Sarah Morgan Brooking and I'm here in Banff National Park in the Canadian Rockies. Now I came out here just over 20 years ago and when I started leading tours for Tauk, I absolutely fell in love with it. So I decided to move here. So even though I'm originally from Vancouver, British Columbia, I've been living in the mountains here for 20 years. I still get to share these with my guests every year and I'm really excited that I can share them with you today. I'm just up from the town of Banff and I'm standing in front of Banff's most recognizable landmark, the Banff Springs Hotel. Welcome everybody to my backyard. My name is Sarah Morgan Brooking and I'm here in Banff National Park in the Canadian Rockies. Now I came out here just over 20 years ago and when I started leading tours for Tauk, I absolutely fell in love with it. So I decided to move here. So even though I'm originally from Vancouver, British Columbia, I've been living in the mountains here for 20 years. I still get to share these with my guests every year and I'm really excited that I can share them with you today. I'm just up from the town of Banff and I'm standing in front of Banff's most recognizable landmark the Banff Springs Hotel. Now you'll see that it's nestled in the woods and when they built the hotel over 130 years ago, it was essentially in the middle of the Canadian wilderness. And you might be wondering why would they build such a beautiful, grand, luxurious looking hotel, a castle, in the middle of nowhere over a century ago. And to truly appreciate the story of the Banff Springs Hotel, you have to understand a little bit of what was going on in Canadian history. Because the story of the Banff Springs Hotel is indelibly tied to the history of our country. Let's go back in time. I am though going to give you the very condensed version of these early years. Now, the first people to inhabit these lands were of course the indigenous. We now call them the First Nations Peoples of Canada, as they were the First Nations to live in these lands. And then in the 14, 15, 1600s, the European explorers arrived. 
We were a French colony for a while as New France. Then there was a big battle between the French and the English, and we became an English colony, British North America. But then after about a hundred years and much discussion and paperwork with Britain, on July 1st, 1867, we became our own country, the Dominion of Canada. While we were still ruled by the Queen, as we still are now, we were now considered our own nation. However, we only began with four provinces, Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. The rest of what later became Canada were still British colonies. And so our very first prime minister, John A. Macdonald, he was a visionary man and he stood in Ottawa, our capital, and he gazed over towards the Pacific Ocean. He dreamed of having a country from coast to coast. He asked a group of delegates from what is now British Columbia to come to Ottawa to discuss Confederation, the joining together of the country. And this is where the story begins to tie into us right here. Because they had to get there somehow. And the Americans had just finished building the Great Northern Railroad. And so the delegates went south of the border and hopped on the train out east. When they arrived in Ottawa, they discussed joining Canada and they decided it sounded like a good deal. They would become part of Canada, but on one condition. The Prime Minister must promise to build them a transcontinental railroad, connecting them to the eastern side of the country. Otherwise, they would be left out there on, on the west on their own. And so John A. Macdonald agreed, and the Canadian Pacific Railway Company was born. The CP Rail hired a man called Cornelius Van Horn, an American incidentally, and he oversaw the building of the railway across the country. There's actually a statue of him in front of the Banff Springs Hotel. He was an entrepreneur at heart, and when he arrived out here, he looked around at the incredible mountain peaks and natural beauty, and he said, if we can't export the scenery, then we shall import the tourists. And it was his idea to build big, beautiful luxury hotels close to the railway so that more people would pay to take the train and then to stay in these hotels. And the Banff Springs Hotel was the one of the very first of these railway hotels. If any of you think that this structure looks similar to another venerable Canadian hotel, the Chateau Frontenac in Quebec City, you would be correct. The Chateau Frontenac was the next of the railway hotels, and it was designed by the same architect, American Bruce Price. But what about the name, the Banff Springs Hotel? Well, when they were building the railway, a couple of men on a break went out on a hike one day, and they discovered natural sulfur hot springs. Well, this was a big deal. Hot springs were very trendy during the late 1800s, and taking of the waters was considered a therapeutic experience that people were doing all over Europe. Cornelius was very excited about this new discovery as he now had the trifecta, gorgeous scenery, a luxury Scottish style castle, and now hot springs to attract people here, and hence the name, the Banff Springs Hotel. The Canadian government actually ended up protecting the area around the hot springs, calling it the Hot Springs Reserve, which was the precursor to the creation of Banff National Park, which was Canada's first national park. So as you can see, the Banff Springs Hotel is truly part of our Canadian heritage. And since those early days, the Banff Springs Hotel has now welcomed royalty and heads of state and celebrities and, of course, our town guests. The Banff Springs Hotel, this castle in the wilderness, is truly an iconic property. On every tour, when we drive up towards the hotel, I look forward to hearing that sudden inhale of excitement as our guests have their first glimpse of the castle. The exterior is so dramatic with its Scottish baronial style and with the exquisite stonework. Just to wander outside the hotel, you appreciate a different perspective everywhere you look. Every angle is an experience. 
and the combination of this monumental architectural structure and the breathtaking natural beauty and mountain vistas surrounding it is so awe-inspiring. Inside the hotel, our guests can explore the impressive shared spaces with the opulent chandeliers, grand staircases, and stunning interiors. You can feel the history everywhere as you wander through the many halls, nooks and crannies, and the heritage interiors. The hotel weaves modern luxuries with character and tradition. And the staff are from all over Canada and indeed the world, and are always ready to welcome our Tauk guests with friendly smiles. The Banff Springs is really more than just a hotel. It is a destination unto itself. Good morning, everybody, from, from the town of Banff in the heart of Banff National Park. I'm standing here in front of Banff Avenue, which runs right through the town of Banff. And behind me is Cascade Mountain, the 10,800 feet high that frames the, this little town. Now, if you can imagine hundreds and hundreds of years ago, all throughout here were the indigenous peoples, the First Nations of Canada, as we call them. There was the, the Stony Nakoda, the Sutina, the Blackfoot, the Pagan. They traveled through these areas. They lived here. They hunted, they fished, they searched for the bison, also known as the buffalo. But now people come here from all over the world. And we have about 4 million people that come through here every year to visit the town of Banff and the regions surrounding it. Now we also have about 8,500 people that live here full time and another thousand or so that come here just for the season uh, over the year to come and work here. Lots of Australians arrive, the Brits, they come here as well and they come for a, a season to, to live in the mountains. But here's an interesting thing about Banff. In order to live here, you actually have to work here. Because we're in a national park, they have something called the need to reside clause. So that means that you can only live here if you work here. So nobody has a second home here that they come on vacation. You need to come and stay in hotels or a bed and breakfasts. And that prevents too much development. Now, if we're going to be in Banff and visit here, I want to make sure you know how to pronounce it correctly. It is spelt B-A-N-F-F, -F, but it is not pronounced Banff or Banff, it is just Banff, and it's short for the town of Banffshire, Scotland. Now, the reason for this is that this town really only developed into the major tourist destination that it is today because the railroad was built back here in 1880s. And the very first president of the Canadian Pacific Railroad was born in the town of Banffshire. And so that name comes from those early days. Now, some people say it's an acronym, B-A-N-F-F, -F, be aware, nothing for free. And that's because Banff is really the, the commercial hub of, uh, of Banff National Park. If you travel down the street, you will find all sorts of shops and big stores and little boutiques, restaurants, cafes, art galleries. However, that name isn't really fair because you only have to travel a few minutes down the road and you will find the beautiful Bow River, lots of walking paths, little quiet spaces with gorgeous scenery. Really, there's all sorts of things to see and do in Banff, far beyond the shops and the main Banff Avenue. Now, it might not look like it right now because it's completely covered with snow, but that's because it's wintertime. But in the summertime, you would be finding me right on the Banff Springs golf course. This would be completely green and there'd be golfers behind me. This is one of the famous golf courses of Canada, and they originally built it in 1911 as just a nine-hole course. By 1928, it became a celebrated 18-hole course designed by Stanley Thompson, one of Canada's renowned golf course architects. But I'm not here to tell you about the golf. One of the most exciting things about this golf course is who else you might find on this course. And that would be the resident elk. Now people come to the Rockies all the time because they're excited about seeing wildlife. 
and one of the wildlife that they have a very good chance of seeing are the elk. And we have realized that to come down to the golf course is one of your best bets because our elk have discovered that the golf course in the summertime is a perfect place for them to be for two reasons. One, all of this beautiful grass, it's a ready to eat 24 hour salad bowl, just ready for them to go. And second of all, their main predators, which are the wolves, do not like to be around people. So they don't hang out on the golf course. It is the ideal spot for our elk. Now, elk are such an aspect of this golf course in the summertime that they actually have it written into the rule book that if you hit an elk during your play or your ball lands too close to the elk, you can play again. You get your own mulligan because the elk are actually a hazard on the golf course. And you won't just find our elk enjoying a round of golf, but they make their way to our backyards, front yards, the streets, the trails. They can be anywhere. So the middle school actually had to put a huge fence all around its main playground because there were so many issues with the elk wandering on and the kids weren't able to play uh, during lunch and recess. So there's the middle school here and you'll see right in the corner there are the elk hanging out over there. So they've, they've found a spot that they can, they can enjoy. Canadian elk are very polite. They even know to use a crosswalk. I am so excited for you to travel with Telk and experience in person this incredible nature and beauty of my hometown, Banff and the Canadian Rockies. National Park, and then I spent about a year in, uh, in, at the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Uh, and then I, I just, yeah, I got really excited and loved living in those national parks. And when my US visa expired and I couldn't get it extended, I instead ended up in Canada and I moved to Banff in 2004 and it's been my home ever since. So today I will yeah, just take you through what happened in Banff and Lake Louise in the last 15 months during the pandemic where we are about eight and a half thousand people and tourism is the, in the only industry we have. There is literally nothing else. So aside from dentists and lawyers and plumbers, Everybody else works in a hotel, in a restaurant, uh, attraction, transportation company, or a gift shop. So as you can imagine, when the pandemic started and when they closed the international borders in, uh, in, on, in March, it was a huge hit for us. And uh, basically overnight, we became a place with 95% unemployment rate because everything shut down. So for about two months from mid-March to mid-May, everything stopped. And then we slowly started seeing some signs of recovery. Initially, it was local people just trying to keep the businesses alive, you know, buying local, local stuff, eating in restaurants. And then we started seeing people from Calgary and Edmonton coming for a trip just to get away from their homes, you know, from the cities, people trying to escape into nature. And that actually turned out into a summer that was much busier than we expected, and which, which was good. And we are really proud to say that, you know, our local businesses showed a huge amount of creativity and resilience, and they, they adjusted their products so that we could still welcome visitors in a safe and pleasant way. Uh, hotels uh, included some new cleaning procedures and plexiglass and all the staff wearing masks. Uh, restaurants and shops working at limited capacity. Uh, most of the guided activities are op uh, open to private, uh, private groups, so you are only with your family or your own bubble. So basically, I'm sure these are things that you see in all other destinations, basically just trying to stay creative and make sure that we can stay open and that we can still welcome visitors. So yeah, and then fall, winter, spring, similar to the United States and everywhere around the world, we went through three COVID waves. Uh, so, you know, like in Canada, it, like in Benton, like Louis, not so much. We are a small, small, de small destination. So luckily we got, we got uh, spread of that. And for us as a, as a destination organization, it became about the balance between visitation and keeping our businesses afloat and 
is safety, which is our number one priority and making sure that we can still welcome visitors, but everybody is safe, including our community, our residents and, and visitors. So on consumer side, you know, it became about communicating with our local audience, people from Calgary to make sure that they know how to enjoy Banff and Lake Louise in a safe and enjoyable way when we visit. And on the business development side, which is my department, it was about maintaining relationships with important clients like Tauk, and again, making sure that they have all the information they need. So then when the borders open again, and we can welcome you back so that they know what's open and what capacity, what health and safety measures are in place and all that kind of stuff. So even though, yeah, it seems it's a uh, yeah, very slow time right now, we can only welcome Canadians right now, no international visitors. But in the background, it's still uh, hard work for us. And uh, yeah, as I said, our local businesses adjusted as well to the new normal. And uh, there are actually some new experiences that we now offer as a, as a result of, of the pandemic. And one example would be Banff Avenue, which is our main street. We closed two blocks of that main street for vehicles, and it's now a pedestrian zone, which funnily enough, we did it last summer in 2020. And initially it was uh, a safety measure. It was basically to give people more space to physically distance and walk around. But it actually turned out to be an amazing visitor experience and people loved it because all the restaurants in those two blocks set up patios outside and shops set up their stands outside and people could have lunch and dinner while seeing the mountains, you know, watching the sunset over the mountains. So it became a huge success. And according to our surveys, 97% of our visitors totally loved it. So we are doing it again this summer. And I mean, I can't guarantee, but I'm expecting that we will be doing it the next summer and uh, in future as well. Uh, another example would be the Bow Valley Parkway, which is a scenic road that connects Banff and Lake Louise. And half of the road is now also closed for vehicles and it's an amazing place for uh, road cycling. Uh, Aside from that, uh, there are some new companies offering uh, uh, wellness programs like uh, forest walks, uh, forest bathing and nature walks to, for people to unwind and relax and connect with nature. There is a company in town that now offers guided e-bike tours, so amazing experience for those who want to bike around but you know, don't want to get too tired. And uh, we also opened about five or six new restaurants over the past summer and fall and two new hotels that where did we took down the old hotels and built new ones. So there is, there is lots going on and many, many hotels also closed down temporarily for a month or two or three months and uh, renovated their rooms, upgraded their products. So basically make sure that once the borders are open and we can welcome our American and international visitors again, we have, you know, fresh new product for them, new better rooms, new spa facilities and stuff like that. So yeah, lots going on. And uh, as uh, Kelly said, yeah, all, everybody's just waiting for the borders to be open, hopefully soon, we, and uh, we can welcome you back. So yeah, other than that, uh, right now, where we are right now, so we are actually in the stage of reopening. So this is all driven by the Alberta provincial government. And the stage one was launched on June 1st, two days ago. So that's, that's exciting because the vaccinations are going great. In the Banff National Park area, we have about 60% of the population now vaccinated and it's moving fast. So we are confident it will be, it will be you know, we will reach the 100% or you know, majority soon. So as I said, right now we are in stage one. So it means that Indoor dining is now available again at limited capacity. Indoor shopping at limited capacity. We can, we can open our spa and wellness services for one-on-one -on -one treatments. There are small weddings that are now allowed up to 10 people. So, you know, see, seeing, seeing some improvements. And what's even better is that according to the signals we see and the numbers, how they are dropping down of COVID cases in Canada and in the province, we are supposed to move into stage two on June 10, about only a week from now, where there will be even bigger gatherings, gatherings allowed. Gyms and fitness studios and schools will open. And, uh, and then uh, we are expected to enter stage three, the final stage of the reopening on July 1st. So after July 1st, we should be more or less back to normal or to new normal. I mean, there will be probably still some recommendations and guidelines in terms of wearing masks and physical distancing, but after July and going into the summer, 
we are all excited to be pretty much yeah back to normal as much as as possible yeah so it's it was a bit of an overview of all the things that that have changed in Ben Fan Lake Louise in the in the past 15 months but I'm also I just don't want to forget about the things that haven't changed and that's like the core of what we offer as a destination. We still have our big, beautiful mountains, our amazing landscapes full of beautiful peaks and lakes and glaciers. We offer wide open spaces, a chance to see wildlife, uh, you know, grizzly bears, moose, elk, mountain goats anywhere. So we still offer what we always have. It's the nature, it's the quiet, getting away from noise and from, from cities, getting away from crowds of people. And that's something that we are finding that the travelers are now looking for more than ever before. Like we are seeing so, so much demand from cities, people, especially Calgary and Edmonton at this point, because people are just tired of being stuck uh, in their homes for months and months. So people are definitely looking for a destination like Ben Fan Lake Louise. So, as I, as I said, yeah, we, we are still here. The mountains are here, not going anywhere. And uh, working with our great partners at Tau, we are excited to welcome you as soon as we can and show you our amazing landscapes again. So this is pretty much uh, what I have right now. And uh, if people have any questions for me or for Kelly or for Sarah, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you so much, Lucas. We have had some great questions. In fact, uh, people want to know uh, which tours we visit this beautiful city. So the good thing is we do have uh, a quick slide to show you so we can kind of walk through that. And Sarah's gonna help us with that question. Let me get my, my slide up for everybody to see. You good there? Yeah, so hello everybody. I have, in my last 20 years with Tauk, I've, I've led almost all of our tours in the Rockies and uh, all of them go through Banff. And there are amazing things about each of them. And really our guests have loved all of them. So, so anyone you choose is, a, is a, great, a great choice. But let me give you a little more detail uh, about them. Uh, all of them go to the, the premier destinations in the Rockies, which is Banff, Lake Louise and Jasper. Jasper is not quite well as well known, but many people after they experience it, love it uh, just as much, if not more as the other places. And on all of these trips, we stay at the Fairmont hotels, which uh, is definitely an enhanced experience of the destination to stay at these, these hotels. And then each of these trips offers a little something different as well. So I noticed some of you asked about starting in Vancouver. Two of our trips do begin in the West Coast uh, in Vancouver. So we have uh, the Grand Canadian Rockies and the uh, Rockies by Rocky, or the Vancouver and the Rockies by Rocky Mountaineer. Now this particular one uh, starts in Vancouver, which is an incredible city. And if you haven't experienced the West Coast, I would definitely uh, think about one of those tours. So it starts in Vancouver, and then you travel for two full days on the luxurious Rocky Mountaineer. Uh, you stay overnight off the train uh, in the middle of the province, and then you continue on and travel through the Rockies. Uh, the other one that starts in the West is the Grand Canadian Rockies. And that one also visits Vancouver and Victoria, which is a, a beautiful, beautiful city to, to visit. Uh, it is a bit more of an adventure because it takes the train overnight. So you stay on the train and then you reach the Rockies. Uh, we have our, if you want to experience Canada plus one of your own American national parks, then I recommend the, uh, Canadian Rockies plus Glacier National Park, because that adds a couple of nights in the Glacier, which is a more rugged, remote destination. Uh, and then if you really wanna focus on the Rockies themselves for just the, you know, the eight day trip, the, the real highlights are the best of the Rockies. And uh, that's our, our classic destination. And then if you're traveling with, with kids, uh, if you're a parent or a grandparent, then we do have our bridges, which is a multi-generation trip. So it's similar to the best of the Rockies and it stays just in the Rockies, but the trip is tailored to multi-generation, to kids, to grandparents. So there you go. Awesome. And I'm just, I'm just at seeing a few people asking about skiing during these trips. So I just wanna mention, and I love your asking, because as you know, I'm a skier. Uh, you will have to come back in the winter for skiing because uh, 
that is the only time it, it's available here. Although having said that, uh, our, our last ski hill just closed uh, uh, on the, our long weekend, which was the May, 20, May 22nd, 23rd, 24th. So it's remotely possible if you came on one of our very first trips, you could reach our skiing. But at this point, we don't offer any trips uh, in the winter, but we do ski here, most definitely. That's why our winter visitors primarily come here. And there's a definitely some questions about what uh, what's the best time of year to visit? Any either one of you want to take that one? Yeah, Sarah, do you want to go? Sure. Sure. Uh, what's the best time of year to visit? Well, I do our trips from May until October, and every I love every season, but they are different. So things to consider is that if you come in the spring, and spring for us is uh, May to early June then you're going to find lots more snow in the mountains. Uh, it, we actually call this season sprinter, which is spring winter, because we're, there's a bit of both happening. There, it is really beautiful with all that snow. So that's definitely a highlight at that time of the year. Plus, uh, you also have less crowds. Um, it, uh, the temperatures can be, can be warm. We can get in the 60s, 70s, even early 80s. But you will find at this time of the year in the morning and in the evenings, it tends to be a little brisker. If you come in the summer, which would be July and August, uh, it generally is temperatures a little higher uh, and the mornings and the evenings are warmer. Uh, the highlight in the summer are the wildflowers. Those are, are definitely blooming July, August, which is really beautiful, but there's more crowds for sure in July, August. September is our fall season, September, early October. And what's so beautiful at that time of year is the, the colors of the aspen trees. So they turn a gorgeous golden, uh, golden orangey yellow color, and they're really quite, quite stunning. The other thing is that typically we get another snowfall at some point early September. Uh, it doesn't last on the ground, but it does stay on the, on the mountain. So you'll have a really pretty dusting of snow in September, which is, is really beautiful. Uh, so that those, so e either any of those, times are, are a great time to visit. Yeah, you've covered it really well, Sarah. I would just add a funny tidbit is that we actually have people who come specifically for like the first two or three weeks in May, because that's the time, uh, it's the spring, like full on spring down in town, everything is green and the uh, Banner Springs golf course usually open on May 1st. But as, as Sarah said, like our ski hills will be open until third week of May. So. We get people who really enjoy, and you see photos of social media of going skiing in the morning and then golfing in the afternoon. So you can do two of these very different activities on the same day. So it's, it's just a funny thing that you can experience in May. And in fact, um, Sarah, do you get time when you're traveling with the Tauk tours, do you get some of that free time to experience the outdoors with like kayaking or doing any of these like bike riding? Do you have extra time to do that? One of the, the, the best things I think about how these itineraries are designed is that we always build in this unscheduled time because everyone wants to enjoy this in their own way. I have had people that want to just take a book and go sit somewhere down by the lake and just relax and enjoy uh, and, and not move around at all, but just experience the scenery. Others will then start use that time to go on a hike, kayak, uh, canoe, bike. I mean, there's so many outdoor uh, things to do and there's always time time built in to do that so that's what's a really nice a nice part of of the way these itineraries are so yes definitely time for that and you know it's funny lucas did you i'm sure you saw this question come in it seems like somebody saw mary the grizzly are you familiar with that mary the grizzly bear um she was feeding <laughs> cubs on the lawn of a hotel between the hotel and the lake and they were there for several days and oh, I was I was Mary around. Mary. I saw that once. Did? Did I, I didn't know her name was Mary. That's new to me. But they're talking about Lake Louise. Mm -hmm. because, but please know that's not common. In once in twenty years that I was there, I happened to be there, and there was a grizzly and her cubs in between the lake and the hotel on the grass on the side. And they had they had Parks Canada was there. They blocked it off, so you had to be at a distance. And it was definitely very exciting for all of us to see that. But but don't expect the grizzly, grizzly bears to just be hanging out there every time you go. But no, it can happen. You do have wildlife quite readily available when you're visiting that area, correct? 
Yeah, yes, we do. I mean, it, it's really hard to predict because they can, you can just see them anytime. You can go for days without seeing them. And then another day you can see deer or elk walking pretty much in downtown Banff. So you can see a bunch of them in, a, in one day. But there are also local companies. Again, if you have a free time in Banff, local companies that do wildlife uh, watching tours, especially in the evening. And they have really knowledgeable, experienced guides who know the best places and the best time. So they have about 95% success rate. So with those, you are pretty much guaranteed that you will see either elk, moose, big on sheep, mountain goat, or any kind of animal. But yeah, we have yeah we have wolf, cougar, yeah, like wide range of wildlife, which is very exciting for us. That's great. And uh, all of our tours, go ahead. Sorry, all of our tours travel the Icefields Parkway. And the Icefields Parkway is, le is, is a good place to see the animals on the side of the road. So I typically on my tours would see a bear at least once, at least every two tours. So I would say 50% of my tours see a bear. Uh, elk are, are definitely more common. We see them in Banff and ja Jasper even more uh, as, as well. And then uh, you do have chance, we leave earlier in the morning when we're driving uh, often on between Banff and Jasper. Uh, and so you have, good chances to see them there. We're, we're always, we know that's part of our job to be alert. So the driver and the guide are watching for the animals for you. Not a zoo, but they are out there. Safari experts. Can I just, can I just add, uh, Kelly, I, I'm seeing one question that is related. Somebody's asking what is the best time of year to see the wildlife? Yes. And, uh, Sarah can pitch in, but I would say from my experience, it's like May and June, especially for grizzly and black bears. Because they usually wake up from the from the sleep from winter hibernation in late March or in April, but because there is still so much snow higher up in the mountains, they stay down in the valleys, which means that they are close to the highways, roads, and towns. So May and June is the best time, and then as the snow recedes and melts, they are moving higher up into the mountains. So you can still see them, but the chances are definitely best in May and June. Yeah, I would say May, June, and then the fall, and then the summer. Again, possible, but not as frequent in July and August. Um, and just to answer, you know, some people are asking about border openings. You know, the, it's still unclear to us. So just to answer that question, it's still unclear. Uh, vaccination requirements, still unclear. But um, there is a page on Tauk that you can visit, tauk.com slash open or tauk.com slash health. And that's where you can kind of keep track of the, these types of questions moving forward. So just to answer that. Um, now, and I have another question here, which actually has come in quite a, a bit is, um, and Sarah, I think you could take this. Do you think this, uh, the tout trips are suitable for anyone that has to use a walker? Oh, um, yes, you, we, we definitely can accommodate that. It's, you just have to be aware that you would may choose for certain activities. For example, if we do, we do a, a guided hike, more of a walk, but on, on even terrain that you would choose to, to stay back perhaps, or stay and enjoy the, the scenery at the hotel or on the side of the lake and not just do as much. Um, the, the only thing to consider is the hotels are big. These are, these, are, these are not small little hotels, the elevator's right there. So there's a lot of moving around in the hotel. It is not uncommon for us to borrow a wheelchair, for example, from the hotel, just to move around the hotel. Um, yeah, but you, we definitely can accommodate and, and uh, you would just spend more time enjoying the scenery uh, and less movement around within the scenery. Makes sense. Um, now there was a question actually about hotels that came in. It's uh, what's the difference between the Banff Springs Hotel and the Fairmont Lake Louise Hotel? Uh, well, they're both Fairmont hotels. They, I was just, and they both have a chateau style to them. Uh, but there, one is one. It's a, a different visual. Uh, the Banff Springs is definitely more of a Scottish. It's brick, it, 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 and it's much bigger. And the Banff Springs Hotel, I would say the focus, the hotel itself is a destination. There's so much to do just wandering around the hotel itself. And the views out of the hotel are beautiful, but they're part of the experience. Uh, whereas at Chateau Le Louise, also a beautiful hotel and also things to see in the hotel, but really the focus is looking out. And the way the windows are designed in the hotel, their experience is really focused with the view being the primary feature. And what's really great about staying at Chateau Lake Louise is that you can experience it earlier in the morning and later in the evening because it gets really crowded with day trippers in the day. And it is a huge advantage 
to be able to just one, look out your, your window and see the view or sit in one of the restaurants and see the view or to get up in the morning or in the evening and go out there in a more peaceful environment to really experience it. Yeah, I, I can just add again a fun fact is that the two hotels, the two Fairmont hotels are the only two tall buildings that you will see in Banff National Park because uh, the town of Banff being inside a protected area in the National Park, there is a rule that all the buildings can be maximum ground floor, first floor and second floor, because we want to make sure that people who come, no matter where you are walking, whether you are on Banff Avenue or any street, you always see the mountains, you don't see any big buildings blocking the view. But the two Fairmont hotels were built in 1888 and the other one was, I believe, 1908. So they were built before the rule was put in place. So these are the only, only top buildings in, in the park that you will see. That's special. Now, I am curious if one of you could answer this one. It's a good question. Um, because of glacial wear, what is the geology of the mountains? Is it um, originally volcanic or is it, was it ocean, folded, uplifted? Does anybody have any knowledge uh, that would answer that one? Okay. So these are not volcanic mountains. There are no, vol no, no, uh, no volcanic rock here. These are uh, sedimentary rock. Uh, and metamorphic rock. So the very, the very quick background is this whole area was a shallow sea, rivers and streams poured silts and sediments into it. They layered the bottom of the valley floor. Uh, eventually it hardened into hardened sedimentary rock. Uh, plate tectonics, 200 million years ago, they hit, collided, uplifted all the mountains. Now you've got them. You can see the one in the background of my picture right now. Just imagine that side of the mountain just uplifted right up. Uh, and then they're continuing to be eroded. So most of the rock that we see here is uh, limestone, uh, shale, sandstone. Then you have, uh, when that rock was, was impacted by great heat and force, it changes, it metamorphosizes. So we have metamorphic rock. Uh, we have uh, shale and sandstone uh, as well. So we don't have no volcanic rock. And if you come on a tour with me, I'll give you a little more detail on how that all works. <laughs> um, Quick question back to the itineraries that we that you spoke about, Sarah. There are two itineraries that travel from Vancouver on train, and there's a there's two different trains, correct? So can you just speak to the two different trains for us? Yeah. So the original train that went across went right across the country on the tracks, uh, Canadian Pacific. That now only carries cargo. Now, the train that goes right across the country is a company called VIA. So VIA carries people. And the overnight train that goes from Vancouver to Jasper, but you sleep overnight during that journey, uh, is, is the VIA train. So it no longer carries cargo at all. It's this particular train just carries people. It will then continue from Jasper and go all the way to Toronto. So there will be people on that train who will be on it for three, four days right across the country. The Rocky Mountaineer, that is a more recent development in the last, I want to say, 15 years or so. Uh, and the Rocky Mountaineer was designed prim primarily as a tourist train only to travel between uh, Vancouver and the Rockies. It does a few other little side trips as well. It is not accommodated for overnight. So people would take the train halfway through British Columbia. They get off in Kamloops at whatever time the train ends up arriving. Uh, and then they would stay overnight at a hotel in Kamloops, then get back on the train in the morning and continue on. And then the train turns around and goes back. It doesn't continue on further in the country. Got it. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, this is interesting. Has there been any, um, any recent solar or um, wind turbine activity happening in the area? Building? There's a lot of people who have solar on their houses and some of the buildings have solar. I don't believe we're windy enough to have, do we, do, Lucas? Yeah, I don't, not, I, not the wind, yeah, but I know there are like uh, smaller lodges or bed and breakfasts and houses that use solar, uh, but not, not any wind turbines as far as I know. I think it's just the, south, the mountain landscape is not really favorable yeah. for that because it blocks the wind. Okay. South of Calgary, there's definitely wind power, mm -hmm. but not, not in the Rockies themselves. Okay. Um, how about the, there was a couple questions about the Calgary Stampede. I know that sometimes our tours might overlap. Do you have any? Yeah, so any, the, the Stampede is in July, normally. Um, they are 
I think it's around, the dates change somewhat, but it's around the second week of, of July. We do not have any tours that, that involve the stampede. We don't take guests to the stampede, but we do, we definitely have lots of guests who book their trip around it. And then they choose to go to the stampede before or after their tour because, because our tours all begin in Calgary. So it's very easy for you to tack that on. Um, just consider that it, it's definitely, it's very popular and you want to book hotels early. We are really lucky because Tau actually blocks ahead of time. We always have extra, you know, a few spaces in the hotels and many people book a pre-stay with us. And so you have a better chance of getting it during that time than, than others may, but, but uh, yes, you would book it on your own and you can definitely combine it. That's a great point. Um, so when you're booking, you can just ask for a pre-night hotel stay and you can also ask for post-night hotel stays, which are mostly all in Calgary. Um, yes. I would definitely, if somebody's wondering, should they do a pre-night or a, if they're just going to do one, I highly, highly recommend a pre-night stay. I just think it's a much better way to start your trip because there's no stresses of timing and you have that extra day and travel issues and you can settle in and the excitement. And so I, if you, if you're wanting a, an opinion, I would say a pre-night is always, yep. I think it's preferable to a, the post-night if you can only choose one. Yeah, great point. Um, a couple questions. Do we ever see the Northern Lights up there? Uh, I can take that one. Uh, you can. Unlike uh, destinations in Northern Canada, like Yukon or Northwest Territories, we don't sell it as a product because the chances we feel are not high enough to you know, not disappoint. I would say on average, especially fall, winter and spring, you would probably see them once every 10 or 14 days. I would say probably yeah, once every two weeks uh, would be the average. So if you are committed, there is actually an app where you can sign up and you get notifications from University of Alberta in Edmonton that give you a heads up when there is a chance. So yeah, I would say we invite people to see the night sky and stars and we say, if you are lucky, you may also see the Northern Lights. Okay. In Jasper, I know we're focused on Banff, but I will say Jasper is actually now recognized as a, a night, a dark sky preserve which means that it has a minimal amount of artificial lights and they change the lighting in the town to minimize that as well. So that it's one of the best places to come and see the stars. And there actually is a, uh, um, a planetarium, right, a small one right on the property at Jasper Park Lodge right now that some of our guests choose to be part of. Um, and what Jasper Park Lodge has done as they will, you can call for a Northern Lights wake up. So the night watchman, security people, uh, if they see them and you've asked for that wake up call, I, I'm not sure if they're continuing to do that, but that was what they, the last couple of years they've done that. And, and in Jasper, you're in a hotel where you, uh, sorry, you're in where, where, where you open your door and you're just outside. So it's much easier to, to access that. So it, it's, it's definitely a little bit more, there's more possibilities I would say up in Jasper. Okay. Um, now, I have a question that I can start with, and then I think, Sarah, you could probably add to. Are tours appropriate for a family with a three-year-old or a six-month-old baby? And I would say most of our Bridges tours recommend, the recommended age is actually starting at eight. Um, a lot of that has to do with there, there's a lot of, there's coach time involved. Um, so, you know, having a young, young child, it might be a challenge to have, um, you know, that much time on a coach. Uh, do you have any other Further comments on that, Sarah? Well, there's, there's two things I would say. I have had a one-year-old on a trip before, but it was a private family group, which often in Bridges, we do get an entire larger families who will book out a trip. And the, the family knew that the, they knew the baby was gonna be on, the one-year-old, and they were prepared to deal with any of the noises or anything else that would come with that. And the family knew that this particular child was, was a fairly easygoing baby and, and would adapt. And they managed, they just worked around and they made it work. But if you were booking a trip uh, to join other guests, it's not ideal because we just don't know if it's gonna inconvenience, if it's gonna be difficult to manage around uh, um, with the child. But if you were, if it was your uh, private group, then you know it, it's, it could be worked out. It, you just would understand, yes, there's definitely time on the coach and, and uh, uh, and, and our activities are, are geared towards eight and up. Right, yep. Um, a couple of good hotel questions, actually. Um, when was 
Well, we have a, when was Lake Louise Hotel built? Do we know that one? I believe it was 1908, but let me double check. Quickly. Okay. Um, now, kind of going back to the, um, the, the Banff Springs Hotel, there was a question about the stones used to build the hotel. Were they quarried locally? And, um, you know, how did they, do we know how they got them there? Do we know anything about that? I can answer that in the early days when they first built it, yes, the stone came, came locally. Uh, uh, Rundell stone, they called it, because Mount Rundell is the mountain that's right behind me. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but they referred to it as Rundell stone. But they, they eventually, we realized that when it became a national park, which was later, they were not going to then mine for anything in a national park. So we no longer would take any of the natural rock from the area. And so when they did a big renovation about uh, 15, 18 years ago, uh, they brought in rock from other parts of Canada. Um, Tyndall Stone, it's called, uh, which you'll see in other big buildings around around Canada, but it, it had to come from outside of the park. Okay. Um, a little so bit. To the, sorry, to the previous question, I did quick research. I was very slightly wrong. So the <laughs> Fermont Chateau Lake Louise Hotel was built in uh, 1890. So two years after the Fairmont Bear Springs, which, which was 1888. So I was off by 22 years only. Yeah. <laughs> Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> you still get to keep your job. Okay. Uh, there was a big fire and there was a bunch of rooms uh, and function rooms renovated in 1910 or 1912. That's why I think it was stuck in my head. Good. Um, let's see. There, uh, there was a question just because it came up, I think, in the coach concept. Uh, like, how long are the rides on the coach um, typically? I know they oh, they're really there. There isn't really a typical answer to that because it really changes from day to day. And and but normally uh, we I mean, I would would say that we, we bat, we'd like to balance it out. So no gone are the days where you just have these long coach days, day after day after day. It's it's if, for example, driving from the longest coach drive uh, on on these trips would be from uh, Banff to Jasper. And so we will take the day. I mean, you could do that in two and a half hours if you were to drive straight, but we take the day because this isn't just destination to destination. This is, this is about the journey and about stopping and having lunch and seeing and spending time. So we, we want to maximize our time there. So we might have a day where we are traveling that whole day, but there's lots of stops, time to walk around, you know, visit lakes, stretch your legs. Uh, to see things. But if we have a day like that, then likely the next day, for example, uh, would be a, a, a there's a, a 10 minute drive, have a morning activity somewhere, and then the, the afternoon on your own. So very limited driving the next day. So we try to balance it out. So you, it is tiring, we know, mm -hmm. being on the coach. So there's definitely a, a mix of. Yep. Time. And I, I think that is a pretty standard, uh, that's pretty standard across all TAUC tours that involve coach coaching so it's I will just mention the only tour that does have a little bit longer of a driving is the one that goes to Montana because mm -hmm. going from Calgary down to Montana uh, but then you're there in Montana for two nights with very limited driving and then and then you have a drive from Montana back up to, to Lake Louise the great thing about this tour though is that the scenery is stunning mm -hmm. so it's so beautiful I've done tours where there's not that much to see on the drives but this one you're, ent you're, you're interested and entertained and engaged the whole time with what you can see out the window. Yeah, that's so true. Um, and then we do have a question about, I think we're talking about the uh, getting onto the glaciers. We have tours that get folks out there on the glaciers in vehicles, right? Uh, yes, yes, there is. There is the uh, Columbia ice field yep. uh, and they're called the ice explorers. So they're huge trucks. Uh, with massive tires and they do drive out onto onto the glacier. So uh, we do that on uh, all of our trips. Uh, and that's just between Banff and Jasper. Basically the border of Banff National Park and Jasper National Park is where that, that occurs. Great. Okay guys, it looks like we're just coming up here on the end, to the end of our time together. So much to see up there in Canada. Canada, open, please open. Give us, take us back. Um, yes, 
If there are any more questions that you all have, do not hesitate to call. Um, we have reservation sales counselors that are really knowledgeable and happy to answer questions about these tours or any TAUC tours. Um, insider tip Mondays are very busy on the phones here these days, so keep that in mind. But anyway, I want to thank you all for joining us. I want to thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Lucas, so much for your time today. This is a lot of fun. Um, everybody, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and we hope uh, that you can join us again here inside Talc. Bye, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you all. Bye. Of course. Thank See you. you for joining.